section of a hive that's had some beetle problems and uh, we'll try and talk about some preventative measures that you can take and also identify what the problems are. But before we do that, Becky Tipton here and I will be making a wax moth trap. So, as you can see, we have a two liter bottle. It started to fog up a little bit, but in the bottom is a banana peel. Step one, put that banana peel in your two liter bottle. Also, I have a hole right here that's about an inch in diameter and it's just below the curved surface of this two liter bottle. I've tied a nice ribbon on here so I can hang it. You might want something a little bit more sturdier, but just for display purposes today, we're using ribbon. Okay, so the first thing that we need to dump in the bottle after the banana peel is one cup of water. We have these pretty little display measuring cups from the Mother Earth News Closet. Uh, you might see these in the magazine sometime. So we'll go ahead and dump this in here, whole yeah. side up. Okay, they're really pretty cups, but maybe yeah. a little, not, yeah. not the best part not, cups. Not exactly functional, but hey, here we are. Next is a cup of sugar. Since I just used one for water, we're going to step down to a half of cup for the sugar and do it twice. Loving your shirt, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All things bees. Yes. Wear your passion. Tell everyone about it. Okay. That's it. There you have it. And then we're going to let it set for a few days. So it kind of ferments. Right. We want it to ferment. We want it to get kind of stinky so the moths will be attracted to it. Something that I've heard is that uh, hornets can also get trapped in this. They'll go in the hole. Um, but the important question that I asked was, well, what about my bees? Are they going to be yeah. attracted to this? And uh, the people that have used it have said no. Their bees weren't attracted to it. So they hung it on a tree right outside their hive and caught wax moths with it. So that's Yay. one thing that you can do. Um, it's cheap, it's easy, and why not if it prevents a little bit? So from there, let's go over to our hive. Becky, are you going to wear your baffler or are you pretty confident? Well, you know, I'm afraid that what we really have is a dead out. Okay. And so there may we may see a few bees, but I would be very, very surprised if there are even bees from this hive. It looks to me like it might be kind of like neighborhood bees that are just investigating. Okay. And then I haven't introduced you yet to Steve Tipton. Steve is Becky's husband. He's also a master beekeeper and they're with the Northeastern Kansas Beekeepers Association and they're helping us go through this hive and identify what we're looking at. So if you have any questions for them, feel free to put them in the comments and we'll check them out. Okay, the hive entrance was here facing to the west. This hive has just been moved in here, so this was not a permanent location. Right. And if you'd want to come in closer, you can see that there's ants along the top getting a free meal. You know, the ants typically don't you want to say okay. The ants typically don't bother the bees a whole lot. I think they bother beekeepers more than they okay. bother the bees. And so we just uh, usually knock them out for the hive whenever well, we see them. Well, that's good to know. What can I help you with, Steve? Not, really nothing. Uh, I'm going to break this in half just okay. because it makes it a little easier to work. There's oh, a little yeah. weight here, so it obviously has some some honey stored in it. Let's and stop right now, and we're going to do it's a, it, it's a de It's a definite dead out. There are okay. no, no bees in it. Stop okay. with this cursory kind of inspection because we're already seeing a couple of things that are really troubling. 
we see the larvas moving around on here, but that overall sheen, that glossy look, we just refer to that as slime. Okay. And in all honesty, the bees find it abhorrent. They just will not remain in a hive where that has taken place. And so probably, even when there was only a small patch of that, when it was just starting, the bees kind of went, we're out of here. They load up on honey, whatever is left, and they just act like a swarm. They fly away. Okay, so they take their queen with them. They take everything. It, yeah, it, well, the an, queen and all a, the workers. It, it's yeah. it's, I mean, it's dis disruptive to the hive. Uh, the smell of the slime it is repulsive to them, and they, that's why comb management is really important so that the, the bees uh, can herd the, the mites around, keep them from laying eggs, mm -hmm. because they're a secondary predator just like your wax moths, okay. and in a healthy colony they're not an issue. But this colony obviously had s lost a queen, had something go the matter with it that let, let the mites get a toehold and, and be able to reproduce. Okay, so there are still some bees in here. Uh, do you have a theory about what they're doing here? Uh, we're guessing that they're robber bees. It looks like they're on this center frame. I'm going to pull it out real quick and we'll okay. see kind of what's going on there. Sorry everyone for the wind. I'm sure you're hearing that uh, through the microphone. One thing we can't plan for. It's Kansas. Yeah. tail end of the, of the bees were in this hive uh, there's not enough to make a buy you know it's not a viable colony it's uh so what type of larva do you think that we're seeing Th this this is definitely small hive beetle larva okay now this is is a, is a, a wax moth this is a wax moth cocoon. Cocoon. and I don't know how old Becky, you're giving me the heebie-jeebies oh, right now. Oh, it is kind of gross. <laughs> it's kinda gr I was trying to see if there was an actual live larva in it. That this is, yeah, that's a viable larva. So they've had both predation okay. by wax moth and small hive beetle. Uh, you know, the the hive the hive is lost, and, and uh, there's actually a, a live small hive beetle right here. Okay. The adult. An adult. Yeah. There's a couple of them. You can identify them. There are some other little beetles that look like that, but if you get them on a, on a light surface where you can really look at one of them, their identifying characteristic is their club antenna. They have these little short antennas, but there's a little ball on the very end, okay. and it makes them pretty easy to identify rather than one of the other small beetle family. So while we're going through this hive, uh, what are some things that you can do to watch out for a small hive beetle so this doesn't happen? You know, we have a lot of them in Kansas now, um, so when you're doing that inspection, just being aware, typically the bees can manage them, and if there's a few small hive beetles, you'll find them up in a corner someplace because the bees have actually herded them to this little location. Then when we open the hive, they go every place because the bees are disrupted and so they run all over. So kind of looking at that first opening, where are they, how many are they, I usually take them over away from the hive, take my hive tool, and go bump, 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 bump. <laughs> and that's, that's, my, that's my treatment for the, for the small hive beetle. But um, if you see way, way more than that, I mean, mm -hmm. there's something that like, oh my gosh, they're in this corner, they're in this corner, they're in this corner, then you really need to talk about trapping them okay. or doing something to kind of corral them yourself. That's kind of... See, there's... Throws in China. Uh, that's quite... Um, actually, well, there's... This is the fermentation. You can see readily see quite, here. quite a bit of honey in this... smell that fermented smell, yeah. too. Yes. In and this honey, and, and it, 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 it's repulsive enough that the robber bees haven't even come in and cleaned it out. Mm -hmm. This The bubbly look to it is... Uh, it is... Yeah. It's really... And, and unfortunately, this is a plastic frame with plastic foundation, and so I don't think that we can even pop the foundation out of it. That there is no way to clean it up that the bees will then accept it. So it isn't even like I could go, oh, I'm going to wash it off. You know, this is slime mess. We're going to 
wash it down mm, won't work. So you, uh, really, you really are going to end up burning it. You, so, you could well. Okay. Yeah, prob probably would be the best thing. Uh, I mean, it, uh, if you count your time worth anything at all, the time it would take to scrape this off, mm -hmm. uh, set it in the sun, and and maybe power wash it. Uh, it can be reused, but you know. The amount of effort that you'd have into it, you'd be far better ahead just replacing. So when it. you well, have on, these wooden frames, how would you clean them differently, or what makes them well, better in this, that situation? This particular frame is, you can see the wires is wired wax foundation, and it would just be a matter of knocking the center out of it, mm -hmm. and you could be uh, washed uh, and rewired with with a, okay. a, a new new foundation in it. The, the wooden part of it, you can always salvage. Okay. Uh, it's, it's what's in the middle that the moths of, uh, or the the beetles have ruined that, that you're going to have to get rid of. Okay. So in my situation, I had um, a very similar thing happen to my hive this summer, and I talked to you about it, Becky, and just asked, what can I do? How can I salvage my bees? Can I collect my bees? Can I get a new queen? Can I put them in a new hive? What can I do? I, I see the bees in here. Surely there's something, and really there's not not a lot I can do is kind of what we came to the conclusion of. So um, I ended up dumping out my hive. Uh, I even thought about making like a, an ant colony, but with bees. I thought that would be neat, but you know, that would only last for a week or two. And because be these, gone. the hive structure, bees depend upon each other. Bees can't mm -hmm. ever live in a solitary arrangement. And scientists know, this isn't my research, that about 2,500 bees are kind of the minimum needed to sustain a colony and to be able to carry on the functions of the colony and do what's needed. And so when we're looking at a couple hundred bees, there just aren't enough there to actually do the jobs that need to be done. And they'll just dwindle and die. You can keep them alive with sugar water for a, a period of time, but mm -hmm. it's kind of, kind of hard. So if this... If this were our hive, in all honesty, we'd probably take those few bees that are in there away from this hive. This hive is going to move away someplace else, but like take it out into the middle of our bee yard and just brush them off, and they would find another home and be accepted into it. That's okay. it, that, I know that we always hear stories about how, oh, they're going to fight bees coming in. Well, that would be if they were really trying to rob. These bees aren't going to come in robbing. They're just going to collect a little nectar, go in, and kind of go, yeah, we'll and you know you, sure. you can tell uh, some of the some of the ends of their wings are broken. They're older bees. They're they're doomed anyway this time of year. They mm -hmm. only live five and a half, maybe six weeks. So uh, it uh, it just uh, uh, it's just a loss. I mean, mm -hmm. and and it uh, could it have been prevented? Uh, yes, because you know uh, uh, on a weekly inspection schedule where you're looking for your your eggs, your larvae. Uh, you're checking your brood pattern. You'd have noticed there's something the matter here, right? And and could have taken steps early on to correct it and and, and save the hive. And and that's why that's why being uh, vigilant in hive inspections, especially for the small time uh, beekeeper that's that's starting out one, two, or three hives, uh, you have to get into it and see what's going on. You can mm -hmm. see bees flying in and out. That really doesn't tell you what's going on inside the hive. Okay. Well, yeah, bummer. Yeah, so what I ended up doing was putting all of my frames in the deep freeze to Good idea. kill everything that's on them, and then we're going to try and clean it and hopefully reuse it uh, next spring. It didn't have the slime issue yet, so I'm hopeful that I at least will be able to salvage everything without too much work. When you start a package next year and that in that foundation, you will be amazed at how fast it grows because the wax is such an energy intensive activity for the bees mm -hmm. that it takes them a long time to do that. So when you can salvage wax like that, you've, you've jump started your next colony with a great, great effort. So you effort. think I can keep the wax on my frames since they haven't been If it slimed. hasn't been slimed, then I think you'll be okay. You know, if uh, you see discoloration and stuff, you'll know. Okay. Yeah, and then it, 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 uh, th there are different things you can do too to, to maybe help clean it up a little bit. Uh, you can use an air compressor with 35 or 40 pounds of pressure and mm -hmm. blow into the cells to, to like any uh, 
webbing that might be in there, it'll sure. blow it out to the surface where you can scrape mm -hmm. it off. But but uh, if there's any slime, yeah, the wax it's probably going to need to be replaced. Okay. The wax moth webbing, the bees can't remove. And so we use a capping scratcher a lot of times, something that just okay. pull that out. And it damages the comb a little bit, they but you have back. to get rid of that because the bees can't. The bees can't remove the webbing. But they, they, they don't find the frames abhorrent that have been with wax moths. Unlike the small hive beetle that they're just like, yeah, they're not going to deal with it. Someone that. is asking, what is this slime? It is actually fermented feces. Yum. From, from Yummy. From the or from the bees? From the beetles. From okay. the beetle larva. The beetle larva, and it, 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 I guess there's enough moisture in there, and it interacts with the honey, and it ferments, and so, yeah. Another question we have is, does honey taste change by changing crops and seasons? And if it does, what is the best time to eat it? Well, so what's your favorite season of honey, I guess? Um, yes, yes to the answer. Honey is, everything about honey is controlled by the flowers. So the viscosity, the color, the flavor, everything. Crystallization rates. Yeah, all of that with the flowers. And, and so it's all dependent on the floral sources. Because we're here in Northeast Kansas, we're going to say clover is our favorite because that's what we do. <laughs> the, yeah, that's I, our predominant floral source, the, and it is awesome honey. The glaciated region of, of Northeast Kansas produces some of the best best honey in the world. It really does. That's and but we might be biased, but no. <laughs> it's so. If you wait later in the year, and we're, so fall, we'll get a darker honey, and it has a little more robust honey flavor. It will be uh, sunflowers, asters, goldenrod, ironweed, iron weed, smartweed, and that honey that we harvest in October, sep late September, it'll uh, it have a much stronger flavor. And we have a lot of customers that really prefer it. Oh yeah, I want some of that. It's sweeter. It's whatever. I said no, it's not. But I go, yes, it is. I'm glad you like it. You know, <laughs> so just just that they're happy with their their product, and and a lot of people really do like that more robust honey flavor. And how do you store empty frames over the winter? Oh, that's a good question, and one with a lot of controversy. What Charlotte said is absolutely perfect. If you're doing, you've got a couple of hives, and you can throw them in your freezer. That's very organic. It's you know you're not adding anything to it. You're not uh, taking anything away from it. When you take them out in the spring, they'll need to set for about 24 hours and warm up so that the bees won't be chilled when you put them into there. Mm -hmm. But it kills all your wax moth larvae, all your small hive beetle larvae, and, and eggs. It just it cleans them all up, so and, it's a really good thing. The, the, the wax moths are a seasonal pest. Once it gets cold and the nighttime temperatures freeze, you can put your supers back outside and in your and garage, or in your garage or someplace, and and they'll be they'll be fine. Yeah, because wax moths will be gone. Well, until and so will the small high beetle. It, they'll all yeah, be gone. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It is a seasonal problem. So for those of us that don't have freezers that will hold 50 supers to put our honey supers in, usually we treat them with a product that's called paradichlorobenzene. Paradichlorobenzene is a moth crystal. And you can it will it will kill moths. You put it up on top. It's a vapor that goes down through the hives, through the supers. Stack your supers ten high. And put the crystals on the top. And honestly, we'll treat them usually one time in the fall, and that will be good enough to take them until frost. And after heavy frost, then we don't have to worry about it again until next spring. Uh, Paradichlorobenzene is a product that people who want to do more organic don't like, but it is one that is safe for the honeybees. Again, if you were to take the chloral dipen, mm, the chloral dipens, I can't. Chloral. <laughs> now we can either one say If you could take the moth crystals off, paracloridibenzene, and you tried to put your bees on it immediately, um, it would be hard for the bees. They don't like that, and it isn't a good chemical for them. So you, again, you want to be sure and air it out real good before you put them on. Uh, another thing that I that I really think helps with store, storing supers is always use a queen excluder. That keeps the queen from getting up and laying eggs, rearing brood in, in your honey supers uh, because your wax moths and your small hive beetles, the larvae are both protein feeders. Every time a new bee hatches out, it leaves behind a microscopically thin cocoon, which is protein that attracts them. It allows, the, of course, if you've got brood, they're gonna store pollen around it. Another protein that's very attractive to wax moths and small hive beetles. You don't have that in your supers, you don't have problems with, with that secondary predators. I wanted to take a moment and reintroduce ourselves. I'm Charlotte Brunin. I'm with Keeping Backyard Bees and today I'm here on Mother Earth News and Keeping Backyard Bees.
to uh, go through this hive with everyone that's infested with a small hive beetle. The colony has totally fallen, and so we're just kind of talking about what we're left with. Joining me is Steve Tipton, Tipton sorry, and Becky Tipton of the Northeastern Kansas Beekeepers Association. Um, we have a really strong local club, and they're so great to come and join us and go through some inspections like these so we can make sure that we have experts answering your questions. Um, thank you both so much for being here today, and you're also going to record a new podcast on Harvesting Honey, which will come out in a few weeks um, after this. So that's what's going on, and then they'll also be at the Topeka, Kansas Mother of News Fair with the Northeastern Kansas Beekeepers, so you can come to one of their presentations or actually come see them at their booth. So I just wanted to get all that information out there to everyone, um, and now we can kind of go back to the hives themselves. Uh, come come in again. Uh, you know, some of you might have been here during the second half. Let's look at the larva again, if we can. Yeah, let's get a frame out here. And we'll... Someone is asking, um, how much does it cost to start a couple of these boxes? You can usually get started. We do scholarship students, and when we are budgeting for our scholarship students, we try to relocate about $400 for a single hive with safety equipment and clothing that does not include extracting equipment, just the right. basics of the hive. The, the woodenware, two supers, uh, and a package of bees. So and everything you need to get started. Yeah. The, of course, we recommend that if you can possibly swing it to do two hives, so that wouldn't be $800 because you don't need two suits, you don't need two smokers, you don't need all of that duplicated, but um, two hives are much better because if you have a hive that's failing, a lot of times you can do something with your other hive that will help you save both hives and have them both prosper. So it's just a good practice. Yeah. More, more hives, more options. Yeah. Basically. What do you call that stuff there? This is actually just comb that has been that's, torn it's, up. It's, it's, it's like... This, this would have been your central brood area and this, the ring of pollen would have been the first thing around it, and that's pollen that they've, uh, they're feeding, they're, well, they're feeding on it, and, and uh, just. And probably some honey in there as well, like may, up maybe, in this corner yeah, there was uh, some honey. The but ring of honey's around, around that. In the, in the stage when this hive was breaking down and dying, before they actually absconded, there were probably robber bees that came in, and when robber bees come in, they don't neatly open cells, they pretty much tear them apart, and just, they will leave things. They looking. just try to get in and out as but, quickly as yeah. they can before no. someone just sees what they're go. doing. Yeah. Grab it and go is it. So what do you do for routine fall maintenance? Some tips on that. Fall maintenance is, is a big topic all of itself with the varroa mites that we have. Uh, you have to know as much about varroa mites as you do about your bees because if you have bees, you have mites. And now's the time for beekeepers to be uh, selecting their mite treatment and, and Applying it so that the bees can raise as many healthy bees going into winter as possible without without a mite load. So uh, our, our fall management is starts with mite treatment. We check the food level in the hives. We make sure they have sufficient stores. If they don't have sufficient stores, we may have another hive that has a surplus. We'll kind of do a little trade off and let you know, Rob from Peter to pay Paul kind of thing. We'll also feed. feed. We'll feed. Uh, Two, to one. One, two part sugar, one part water, uh, supplemental if we need to, to do that. So the overall health of the hive, making sure we have a healthy queen, making sure that she is laying and as it should be, feeding, medications. Uh, we've already provided a good windbreak by choosing where our hive is located. But if you didn't, if we know, oh, I'm out here on the prairie, I don't have a windbreak, then you need to think about what you're going to do for that for your fall as, as you move into fall. Get a little further, when we get to first frost, we'll be adding mouse guards to make sure that mice don't get in because inside our hive is the perfect mouse home. It has got, they have food, they have warmth, and it's dry. They like it. So <laughs> we want to keep them out. <laughs> gotcha. They can make a mess. Okay, well, I think that's it. Does anyone else have any more questions? Thanks I for asking. Know. Yeah. Th th this is really good because most of the times that we do we do bee talks, we have a healthy hive, and it's good to show people, you know, what Oops. can what can go wrong <laughs> right. if, if you don't religiously get in your hive and, and be a, step up and be a beekeeper. You're going to have a mess like this. Honestly, I was a first year beekeeper this year. I had two hives. One was a package. One was a swarm. Um, and you may have seen the picture of Connie and I catching the swarm. Unfortunately.
unfortunately that's the one that fell to the hive beetle and I was kind of embarrassed. I was like, I should probably use this as a learning tool, but uh, uh, I'm kind of embarrassed that I let this happen. But you know, life happens and we get away from our colonies. So that's a learning experience and I will do better next year. It can happen so fast and it can happen for, it is, they are secondary predators. Mm -hmm. It happened because something else happened. But we've had seasoned beekeepers that it happened to, and they're going like, I was in there. I looked at this. I was sure it was fine. But maybe in that particular time, you didn't realize that it had gone queenless or something else mm -hmm. happened along the way. So things happen. And so, yeah, I, you do kind of feel guilty, but don't beat yourself up about it because it happens to everyone. <laughs> you just try to, Steve's all about, oh, you can prevent it. Well, yeah, you can, but sometimes stuff happens. Oh, well. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks again, everyone, for listening. Um, Becky and Steve have already done a podcast with us. It's called Beginning with Bees, and they did that with Robert Riley and Don Combs. So check it out on iTunes, Stitcher, or uh, there's a podcast button at the top of the Mother Earth News page. And then I believe they will begin contributing to Keeping Backyard Bees, so you'll be able to get some more excellent information from them there. Uh, thank you so much, and also come to our Mother Earth News Fairs to get hands-on with bees, because we are trying to do many more hands-on presentations there. So thanks again, and uh, we'll see you next Thursday.